brain deterioration. But I don't think it's that serious yet, so I hope to have another decade or two of, of reasonable responses. And you have the, the increasing urge to put laws against these, these things because the psychology, the propaganda that they are negative, that they do damage, is very real and very much believed by many people. I've been often asked why use the word psychedelic itself as a pejorative term. I mean, there are empathogens, entheogens, hallucinogens, psychotomimetics, other terms that are used widely in medicine uh, that carry other messages but do not carry the intrinsic negativeness of the term psychedelic. Well, I, my main argument for keep, continuing to use the term is that you, people may not approve of what you're working in or what you're saying, but at least they know what you're talking about. <laughs> You stop nine people on Market Street, uh, uh, ten people, nine people, you say, I work with pathogens." when they ask you what you do, they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, nine people out of ten, when you tell that you're working with psychedelics, would not, maybe not approve, but at least they know what you're working with. So the idea of using a term that is uh, in popular usage, I consider to be quite positive. Well, my clock is still going. The clock is supposed to go flash three minutes from stopping, and the clock has stopped. So I don't know where I am. Uh, let, me, let me wrap things up a little bit. Um, what are the positives? I consider the positives to be the, my main incentive for doing the work I've done for the last half century and continuing to do it now, is I believe in this collection of materials, you're going to develop tools that are going to answer many of the questions that have been brought up today. Namely, how can you find out how the brain works you can use a rat? How does the mind work? What, is the, how, what kind of a probe can you make? to look at the function of the mind. To me, it's going to be a psychedelic material that has very little action in, in, in experimental animals to look into actions in man that are not seen in experimental animals. Namely, the idea of using these materials as eventual research tools, I consider to be extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, the I think what I'll do, uh, a point came up during lunch today, which I, it brought up an interesting story that I think pretty well puts this into perspective about the need of tools for exploring research, uh, research tools for exploring this area of understanding the function of the mind. Uh, as Eric this morning was talking about animals being invested with the properties of, of, of uh, uh, schizophrenia. And this was some years ago, back, back in the good old days before there were many inhibitive, uh, inhibitory uh, actions on human studies, uh, FDA approval, this approval, get clearance from the DEA clearance, from everything like that before you do any human experiments. Your board of your university has to see the research and approve of it. A lot of this experimental work was done back in the, in the Halcyon days when there were no such things as research approval boards. I mean, it, it, in Berkeley, we had the, the run of the place. We, you know, could fire up the psychotron and make an isotope and use it and try it in, in they, they, their argument at, at Donner Labs, that was at Donner, then it went up to the, up on the hill in the Lawrence Lab, was stay if you want and do whatever you want. The tools are here. Here's a psychotron. Here's your PET scanner. Uh, do whatever you want, but just remember, when you leave, turn off the lights and lock the door. And we, we could work through the night there, doing experiments, all kinds of beautiful things. I remember one time, this is kind of, let, so let me use this as sort of a wind up. Uh, we had the, uh, this was some maybe three or four decades ago, it's quite popular opinion that, that uh, methionine was involved with schizophrenia because some experiments had been done in which people who were schizophrenic were given methionine rich diets and their symptoms became worse, and yet those people who were not diagnosed as schizophrenics with the methionine rich diet uh, had no changes at all. So we talked about this pros and cons, and it was a neat experiment. What I did, I, I took a, I remember it's S-adenosine with thionine, there's some compound in that area, and I tucked on a fluorine 18, which makes it a, 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 a positron emitter, which means you can go into a PET scanner and put this into a person and put the head of the person, the person attached to the head, so I mean, no, that didn't sound good. You have the person lie down on a little cot with the head going into a positron camera, and you've had a section of the brain just above the earlobes that tells you where that chemical went. Being a positron emitter, it didn't have to have any reaction in the body, it just went where it went. And what we did, this was work done with Tony some, oh God, years, a few decades ago, 
Uh, I made this material. In fact, I made 10 batches over a period of time. The half-life of fluorine is a little less than two hours, so you can't make a lot of it and keep it for a while. And he had good friends up at uh, Mendocino Laboratory, uh, Mendocino Hospital, and he came back with five names of five schizophrenic patients who were up at the hospital. And we had their names and the backgrounds of them. And uh, in Lawrence lab, I managed to find five normal controls. That was a bit more tricky, but <laughs> we did. And uh, we did 10 batches of this, and we did 10 experiments. We put the material into the, these 10 people about a week apart, and in each case, put them into the, uh, to the uh, PET scanner. I remember one, one of the uh, schizophrenics, Tony, had a lot of problems with because he did not like radioactivity. And he said radioactivity is bad. So we had down at Donner a great big uh, sort of a, a background counter. It's a, a, a big room with a big iodine crystal of 30 some odd inches in diameter and uh, walls, of three inch thick lead overhead and the side. And Tony very nicely told him, if you go in here and spend a half an hour, he'll give you a magazine, turn the leave the light on. If you go in here and spend a half an hour in here, your body will be so depleted of radiation that when we take you up in the hill and put you in the positive camera, we'll bring you back to normal. You'll be okay. He believed it. <laughs> anyway, the, the, uh, a wrap up with the, with the result of the experiment. It was a fascinating thing. We ran 10 studies. We had 10 photographs of the, of the uh, uh, fluorine 18 disposition in the brain. And the 10 photographs were absolutely different from one another. There was no consistency through this group at all. And so we put them on the wall of the, of the uh, uh, medical radiation thing up in the hill. And it's across the back of the wall. Every time someone would come in from Washington to give a seminar or come in from somewhere of, of any importance, we say, by the way, here are 10 photographs of the fluorine 18 labeled material we gave. Five of these are schizophrenic patients, and five of them are normals. Which do you think are normals? Which do you think are schizophrenics? And we got absolutely random answers. No, 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 no pattern could be found at all. Then about uh, two months, three months later, one of the schizophrenic patients who liked Tony very much uh, came down to visit and see how everything was going on. Very nice visit. And uh, they were talking for a while. And he saw these, these 10 photographs on the wall. And uh, he said, are those the 10 pictures you took of us? Tony said, yeah. And he looked at one and said, oh, I know, I reckon that's me. And he pointed to number seven or one of them over there. And he's absolutely right. He identified his own photograph from the PET scan of the distribution of that fluorine 18 thing. And Tony very mildly, casually said, oh, you know, you're right, absolutely right. How do you know? Oh, he said that, you see that little sort of star-shaped uh, shiny thing in the bottom right corner, a little star-shaped thing? Yeah, he said, I see it all the time. So, you know, we have a long way to go <laughs> before we really can understand uh, how the mind works. But this is a start. Thank you very much. <laughs>